And we're now live. I'm just going to do my customary sip of water as I wait for people to hop on. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, and welcome to Greek Speaks Geek. I am your geek, George O'Connor, clearly speaking English. The Greek I'm speaking in reference to is Greek mythology. Be it a goddess, god, hero, or monster, each episode of Geek Speaks Greek is dedicated to the exploration of some figure from Greek mythology. Today, we're doing actually like a whole group of people. We're going to be doing the Gigantes. I have a lot to say about them. It's going to be a little bit of a scattershot episode, if I do say so myself, because... um. Honestly, the body of lore around the Gigantes is pretty scattershot in itself. You're going to see a lot of mentions, not a lot of complete stories. So it was up to me to kind of cobble a lot of this stuff together for my depiction in Olympians. So hi. Hi, everybody. Welcome for tuning in. Wait, welcome for tuning in. Thank you for tuning in. Um, every episode of Greek Speaks, Greek Speaks Geek, I like to celebrate my amazing fans, who are you, by sharing a little bit of the artwork that everybody has sent in. And today is no exception to that. Uh, first up, we have this is from Liam, and this is uh, it's actually it's a little bit back. It's going to be backwards, unfortunately, you know, because that's just the way stuff shows up in here. He actually drew a comic, which shows you can read that one word right in the middle, a spy. That's two words, I know. This is the moment when so I had talked about in uh, some of the episodes dealing with Troy how Troy had previously been sacked by Heracles and he actually draws a comic exploring that where there's just this soldier who kind of takes off his helmet and then they see like oh my gosh that's not just a normal soldier that's Heracles. Which I love that he was actually wearing like a lion skin underneath his armor. But they're like, whoa, we're in trouble here. Liam, that's great comic. I hope that you post that up somewhere. Uh, it's called Heracles and Troy. So people can actually kind of really, uh, you know, read it. I mean, actually, there's not all that many words. It's just there's so many great details. Like, look at all the great textures and stuff in those first two panels. I love it. So let's see what else we have here. Um, 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 uh, oh. This is this is from somebody who I haven't actually uh, heard from for a bit. This is from Maggie. Hi, Maggie. Maggie is uh, a fan of mine who has shown up to several appearances dressed up as Athena, which makes me look like the coolest person in the world. And she actually sir, sh shared a picture. This is her depiction of Hermes. And nobody knows when Hermes is lying because he is blind. And you're like, what? This is Maggie's theory, and bear with me, this is actually pretty cool. Her theory, I talk about how my version of Hermes, you can never really see his eyes, and he does that because the way to tell if someone is lying is you stare into their eyes, right? So that's a pretty cool idea. Her idea is that he's not just, doesn't let people see his eyes, he's actually blind. And because he is an Olympian, and he has so many different powers and heightened senses, he kind of compensates that nobody really needs to, like, he doesn't actually need the sight because, you know, he has super hearing and super, well, I guess taste. He probably doesn't like too many things. But it kind of, it's kind of like the uh, Marvel Comics character Daredevil, where people don't realize he's blind because his other senses are so attuned that he actually can get by as if he doesn't even need that. And I was thinking about this idea that Maggie sent in. Here, I'm going to show the drawing again because it is really cool. Also, I like that his hair, it's, you might not be able to tell, it's, it looks like it's metallic silver. He's also got a bit of a little bit of a soul patch there. So, like I used to have back in the day before I went full beardo. I often talk on here. Now, a lot of the concepts that we'll bring up scientific-wise were things that the Greeks hadn't really hit on yet, like the speed of light. But we had done some rough calculations on previous episodes, and we talked about Hermes is so fast and has to be in so many places at once that he moves quicker than the speed of light. He actually defies physics. Speed of light is supposed to be the fastest thing there is. He is quicker than that, which means because eyes collect light to see, how does he see when he's traveling that fast? Now, of course, he wouldn't be able to hear either because sound is way slower than light. But that makes sense to me that Hermes would maybe have some senses, which makes sense. He's a god. He's virtually all-powerful. He should have senses beyond our own, including some way of quote-unquote seeing that doesn't use eyes. So I kind of like this idea, Maggie. It's pretty cool. Thank you so much for saying that in. Um, what else we got here? Ah, this is from Yehi. And... Uh, couple of quick comics. This first one, I mean, this is a new style for Yehi. Look at how... So, 
Can you guys hear my cats fighting? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's an episode of Geek Speaks Greek. There's going to be cats fighting. Uh, oh. Wait, let's see if I read this right. What do you think about this, Hermes? Oh, it's... You made this, Athena? And she says, that's a good question. And it's it's definitely, like, it's a... It's a tapestry, right? And it's kind of, like, hard to see what's going on. But look how, like, kind of crazy and violent this looks. And I think the little punchline is here, if you look. It's actually, she didn't make it. There's a spider coming down. It's arachne. It's post-transformation arachne. But a pretty cool little strip there. I thought that was a really neat exploration. And then, yeah, he also did, on our last episode on Monday, we did the Sphinx and um, Oedipus. And uh, here's the Sphinx. I like how big the Sphinx is here. Did you solve the riddle? Yes. The answer, the answer is man. Because, you know, it's that whole thing has one voice, but has two, three legs, no, four legs, and two legs, and three legs. And the answer is man at different stages of their life. And the Sphinx is like, you solved it! Ah! And jumps off the cliff. Oh. And then, so a false rumor spread. The Sphinx killed herself by jumping off the cliff. And I was pointing out how unlikely it is because she's a winged lion. How would she, like, you know, she could fly. And it's just, <laughs> it's a false rumor because there she's just flying away. And she's grumpy that the winged lion threw herself off the cliff to commit suicide. What? Yeah, I like that. So, I mean, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, probably he didn't run to the edge of the cliff to look to see if she splattered. He's like, that was intense and just kept walking on. I like this idea. Leaves the Sphinx alive to create more trouble later, which is, uh, you know, that's more fun. Here, okay, this is one by Ilya, and this is the Sphinx. Look at that great Sphinx. This looks like, I mean, I like this because I love cats, as we know, even though my cats are always fighting in the background. And, like, there's a real cat-likeness to the pose here. And there we have the chimera. We can see because the goat horns and the fire breathing. And there's the Nemean lion. I'm going to really quickly read this for you. She's like, come on, guys. You're blood to me. Why can't you fly? That's what the Sphinx is saying. Because, like, that's a good question. Why can't they fly? And it's like... Come on, sis. This is... Oh, wait. That's the new line. You know we can't fly. She can fly. Okay, you can ride on my back, but uh, you have to answer this riddle first. And the camera is like, really, sis? I like this. I like this look into sibling rivalry among the monsters, among the daughters... Uh, uh, well, children of Typhon and Echidna. Ilya, thank you so much. Um, 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 let's see. Here's a couple ones from Moira. Now, last time we saw from Moira, she had actually introduced me to the fact that you can make your own characters up on Animal Crossing. And I was like, what? So today, she sent us this one. I'm not sure who this is. I'm getting a distinct Persephone vibe off it, but like, it's very springtime colors of it is. Oh, you know what? I see who it is. It's Athena. Look, she's got the armor. She's got the... Okay, that's an Athena. I like how happy this Athena is. Guess you can't do Greek helmets yet in there. But that's pretty great. And then she also sent, here is a picture of, well, there's the Sphinx, human head, lion body, wings. And I'm guessing she went with the idea that the Sphinx's mom is the Chimera, because there's the Chimera. And the dad is Orthos, Orthos the two-headed dog. But look at this cool Orthos. One head's up front, one head's on the back. That's very interesting. When I always pictured Orthos, I always pictured like two heads side by side. But if there's a head in the back, I mean, which side is, which, which way is front? Also, how on earth does that dog go to the bathroom? I mean, I hope you write in with some answers for that one. I, ho I hope it isn't through one of the heads. That's just disturbing, if that's the case. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um... This one is from Adi, who haven't heard from from a bit. Adi made a really beautiful, like, cut-out Pegasus. I like this a lot. Thank you so much for sending that in. That's totally awesome, Adi. Thank you. And uh, I think I'm going to skip something. Oh, no, no. And then finally, today, we have a few pieces from Megan. So Megan sent, here is her depiction of the Sphinx. And this is the Sphinx meeting. If you keep up with Megan, Megan's created her own alternate mythology where Hermes and Athena are a couple and they have like these kids. And most recently, Hermes has adopted a turtle named George, like me. And this is, the tur this is uh, Archimedes the owl, which is Athena's owl, and George the turtle meeting the, um, the, the Sphinx, who's like, the Sphinx's riddle is like, what are you guys? Which is pretty cute. And then, because that... That wasn't just it. We also have George the Turtle meeting the Minotaur. 
And this is clearly my version of the Minotaur. The Minotaur is maybe misunderstood more than mean because he's just like, I'm the Minotaur. He's being all happy and stuff. And then finally, we had talked – I mean, I don't remember where we talked about this episode. We talked about like the, like, the gifting of uh, the head of Medusa to Athena. And here is Megan's version of this. There we have uh, Perseus. Look, you could tell he has ascended to the throne because he's wearing a helmet. And he's with Andromeda, and he's saying, oh, here, sis, the head of Medusa is in this bag. Hope that thing comes to be useful for you, because we know, of course, she ends up adding it to her Aegis. It becomes the tassels. And that's a great last comic to show, because now we're going to talk about the Gigantes, and they play a big part in this, too. If you have any drawings that you would like to share with me, I would ask that you please send them to my email at georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. You can also catch old episodes, which I've referenced about 10 of them without being very specific, on my YouTube channel, youtube.com, t.com, <laughs> youtube.com slash user slash George Olympians. Oh, it's one of those days, everybody, one of those days. So, the Gigantes. This is a whole group of creatures I'm talking about. We'll get into some specifics here. A lot of t people, even if you know your Greek mythology pretty well, you maybe didn't know about the Gigantes. I know for me, it was kind of a weird concept that took me a long time to wrap my head around. I was like, are there Gigantes? Is that just another name for giants? Is that just another name for titans? And so yes, let's just get this out of the way first. Gigantes is another word for giants. Giants is kind of like a more of a quote unquote translation of it. I use the original term Gigantes because what Gigantes means in Greece. So the Gigantes, you might think that name means huge or big or gigantic or giant, you know, words that mean those words that come from this. It actually means born from Mother Earth. And the two Greek words, so the ancient Greeks, they would call Mother Earth, they call her Gaia, or they call her Gay, or J, right? And then their word for born from was genete or genete. They had more of a hard G normally. So it was those two words, gigante, gigante. And because the gigantes were so big, it has been entered into our language, English, the language I'm speaking. It's maybe not all of your languages. Um, it has entered into the into our language to mean huge, enormous, huge. It's I'm having a hard time coming with words that don't directly derive from like giant or gigantic, but it actually literally means born from the earth, which is really fascinating to me, right? So they are the same thing as the giants. They're not the same thing as the titans. Though, you would not be alone in making that mistake. In fact, even in the ancient days, different writers, ancient Greek and ancient Roman writers, often conflated the two, meaning confused the two. So sometimes you'll have a writer, like someone like Ovid even, like a big writer, talking about the Gigantes and accidentally maybe mentioning a few things that seem to be related to the Titans. Some of them even have the similar names. It gets very, very confusing. So... Me, honestly, I kind of knew what Gigantes were growing up, or Giants. Because, I mean, you can even look online. If you look at some early drawings of me, like, I've definitely drawn them. I have pictures of them fighting, like, Greek gods when I'm, like, seven or eight. But I don't think I really understood it. It honestly wasn't until um, when I was working on Olympians, when I first started working on Olympians. This is about maybe... So I've worked in the series for about 10 years. When I first started writing it, it was maybe more like about 12 years or so. I actually went and lived in Rome for a while, Rome, Italy. And I used that as my base of operations. And I traveled all around the Mediterranean world, the ancient Greek and Roman world, and like visited places and visited museums and temples and anything I could find related to the myths. And I, that's when I really, I think I fully got the understanding, like, okay, there is a big difference between titans and gigantes. And like I said, even people back in the day confused it. So, <clears throat> the way it, so we all heard of the Titanomachy, the Clash of the Titans, you know, the famous movie. Uh, the Titans were the original group of gods before the Olympians. Zeus and the OG Olympians fight against them, overthrow them, and they become the gods of the universe, right? The Gigantimachy is the battle against the Gigantes, or the Giants, and it happens later. And in many ways, it's very much a deliberate reflection of what we saw with the Titans. 
there are these giant creatures. They're trying to overthrow the gods, whereas last time it was the gods trying to overthrow the giant creatures. And they're not successful. And what's really weird about the Gigantamaki is you see so much art about it, especially ancient art. This was one of the most popular subjects for ancient artists to depict, either in sculpture, you see it on the side of so many temples, or in vase painting, or even in self-standing statues. There were so many pictures of this. But weirdly, there's not a lot of great stories that survive. So for this episode, I'm going to start off just kind of doing some drawings because so much of my inspiration for this episode came from the original art, all right? When you first see Gigantes being depicted in ancient Greek art, it's probably like about like the year 700 BCE, maybe 800. You see them on vases. And really the only reason you would know that they are Gigantes, because they're not depicted as enormous, is that their names are often written on the vases. And they just kind of look like dudes. They'll have like helmets. They'll have crazy beards, because everybody has crazy beards in those things armor. They're not even particularly muscular. They're carrying like weapons, shields. They kind of just look like soldiers. And you would not really have any reason to not suspect they were soldiers, except for they'll be like, obviously fighting like, I don't know, Hermes or something. And you're like, well, that's a pretty unlucky soldier who gets stuck fighting like, you know, <laughs> an Olympian. And, but, like, you'll have a name written there. Um, I don't know. It'll be, like, written in Greek. Like, poly, oh, why am I writing? It's going to be backwards. And, like, that would be it. Like, that's the earliest thing. This is polybotus. It's not really important. I just chose the first one that came to my mind. So that's, like, the earliest depiction of them. A few centuries go by, and we start seeing the, the Gigantes being distinguished in a way in which they're drawn. And even though, like I was mentioning before, you could find old pictures online I drew of Gigantes, I don't like these drawings, like this design. It's weird to me. It doesn't work. So you would have a, you give them like just a kind of rough human face, right? Give them a beard, hair, huge muscles. It's a terrible drawing, but that's okay, right? You gotta make a lot of mistakes. And then, this is the part I'm like, what? How does that work? Like, their legs will be like snakes. They'll just have weird snake legs. I don't know. That doesn't work for me. That's just a weird design. It's not very impressive looking. It's like, like what happened? You got stuck on, like, the, it's like somebody cut the top of a weightlifter off and then stuck him on part of an octopus. It just looks weird. It doesn't quite, like, and you always see them, they're always kind of like in these positions where they're like, oh, I'm getting beaten up by God and their legs are all curling. I'm like, mm, don't love it. And when I'm like, when it comes time for me to design these characters to draw on Olympians, because I decided this was actually going to be a pretty major part of my series, I'm like, I don't want to draw them looking like that. I, that design just doesn't work for me. It just looks weird. I guess whatever sense of internal logic I apply to this, it just didn't work for me. Maybe it works for you. It's just for me. I don't know. I just didn't like it. So I did some research, and I read and read and read, as I do, and then I found the writings of this... Uh, he was an ancient Greek playwright named Lycrophron. Like, wait, Lycophron. I don't really. I never really knew his stuff, but he had this one little description of the Gigantes that nailed it for me, and it's kind of a cool description. It's almost in a weird little historical aside. He just mentions like, so you know, nowadays we know about the concept of evolution, right? That like the reason why humans look like apes is because we have a common ancestor. We all evolved from creatures that had similar attributes, primates, you know, these little like weird tree monkey things, and apes and humans, and we all have this similarity, right? And the ancient Greeks, they saw this too. They're like, wow, you know, apes really look a lot like people. And Lycophron's like, oh yeah, that's because um, Zeus made apes in imitation of Gigantes. So all of a sudden I'm like, ding, Gigantes, who are giant, who are born from the earth, who are these huge, enormous creatures, they have the proportions of apes, of gorillas, right? So my Gigantes, I, have, I give them these enormous muscles, long arms. But I still, 
I remembered, I shouldn't turn this around all the way, that the depictions of them in so much art showed them with this reptilian feature of these snake legs. Didn't want to do that because I didn't like the legs, but I did like including some reptilianness in there. So I made my gigantes kind of scaly too. So they're like giant scaly gorillas without hair. And, you know, they have claws. And I gave them, like, tusks because I found a couple references to their big teeth. Then that worked for me. It's like they're a shambling mockery of the Titans. They have titanic features, whereas the Titans are very beautiful and elegant and super tall and elevated. These guys have a much more ignominious de de beginning. That, in fact, I didn't even mention that. So I mentioned they're born from Mother Earth. The best account we have of the birth of the Gigantes comes from, you guessed it, Hesiod. And Hesiod mentions when the Titans overthrow Uranus, the sky, and they held him in place, and Kronos, the Titan, took his sickle of adamantine and sliced open the sky. The blood poured forth from the wound he made, and it landed on Mother Earth. And wherever that blood touched, Gigantes were born. And that was also cool. Like, they don't really have a dad. They have, they're born from bloodshed, from a previous overthrowing of a god. And they just kind of come, they rise out of Mother Earth. They're literally generated like Ganete, from Mother Earth. I'm like, that's cool. And I like the fact that they have certain features. You'll see, when I color them, they're kind of colored similarly to, well, I color the Titans and the Earth Tones in the same colors, but they, they mostly run in these Earth Tones, but they're like disproportionate and they're weird looking, they're gross. And I feel like that was a good way for the Gigantes to look. So, now I mentioned there's not a lot of stories about the Gigantamaki. They're clearly mentioned in Hesiod, right? Hesiod says straight up, this is how they were born. And he mentions a few other details from there. He doesn't end up mentioning really the whole concept of the Gigantamaki. He def he tells us all about the Tanamaki. He's my main source. But the Gigantamaki, the battle against the giants, we don't really hear about. But you'll see it mentioned here and there. There's a couple references in Homer maybe that maybe relate to it. Homer doesn't really seem to know that much about the Gigantamaki either. It's something that seems to come out a little bit later. Again, an imitation, the Titanomachy. The best account, and by best account, it's not an account I used very much because, like I said, I cobbled my version together from a lot of different sources, comes from Apollodorus. That's a guy who I've mentioned a lot. I end up using quite a bit of Apollodorus because sometimes he has some pretty good takes on stuff. I have a huge problem with his Gigantomachy. And the problem with it is it's so key to his Gigantomachy, Right? So he has this story that's told that basically Mother Earth, for whatever reason, there's some sort of grievance. We know now that it's because she's mad at the way that the uh, gods have treated the Olympians, but Apollodorus doesn't seem to real know that, or if that's just an idea that hasn't come to him yet. The Gigantes are mad at the Olympians, and they decide they're going to overthrow them, and there's a fight, but there's a prophecy. And this is the part reason why I couldn't really use Apollodorus that much. The prophecy is that the gods can't defeat, they can't kill the Gigantes, they can't defeat them, or kill them specifically, without the help of a mortal. A mortal, not immortal. So Athena's like, I know just the guy, and she enlists Heracles. So Heracles is up there on the battlefield. It's a little hazy if it's on Mount Olympus. It seems like it starts on Mount Olympus, but definitely goes somewhere else. And the Gigantes are attacking, and there is this dude named um, Al Alcaeonius, I think? He's one of the leaders of the Gigantes. And Heracles shoots him with an arrow, one of his poisoned arrows, presumably, and he hits the ground. And, he's like, and Heracles is like, there, I killed one! But he gets up, and it turns out that you can't kill him when he's in his homeland, a place called Palene, or similar to Palace, right? So Heracles jumps down the battlefield and he grabs this Gigante and he drags him to the edge of Palene and then he dies. So, okay. I didn't like that story for a bunch of reasons. I'm just going to say there's another Greek myth very similar to that involving Heracles, Antinous. Antinous is a Gigante. He's born of Mother Earth. He fights Heracles. And in that story, you can't defeat him as long as he touches the Earth. 
So Heracles keeps beating this guy and throwing him on the ground. And every time he lands on the ground, he gets back up again because Mother Earth gives him back his strength. And so finally, the way Heracles defeats him is he picks him up and crushes him in the sky, like in the air. And that's a cooler story. I'm sorry. And, and it's also, I always talk about how I'm going to do another series after Olympians. I'm going to tell the story of Antonius in there because it's a favorite of mine. So I'm like, it's too close. I'm going to save it. Also, I have pretty big problems with Her Heracles being there at all. We'll get to that. Then uh, there's another leader of um, the Gigantes named Porphyron. And Porphyron goes and attacks Hera. And Hera, in this story, for some reason, she's like, help, I can't fight against, back against this Gigante. And Zeus, this is really funny, Zeus hits him with a lightning bolt. Which is like, that's big, you know, boom, shatter, boom. And then Heracles shoots him with an arrow after he's down. I'm like, really? I mean, he got bit by a lightning bolt. That's a little bit of overkill, right? The dude's already probably just a burnt cinder. You're like, I'm going to shoot him with an arrow. And then the battle is turned, right? But it's like, it's kind of like this entire myth kind of to me sounds like, and you know I love Heracles. He's my favorite Greek hero. It sounds like some sort of weird propaganda for Heracles. Like, there's another gigant, a gigante who, like, Apollo shoots in one eye and Heracles shoots in the other. Like, these dudes can't kill him without Heracles. That dude's name is Ephialtes. Ephialtes, Otis and Ephialtes, we'll get to him later. Then, I actually wrote down a list here because they just went through the, I'm going to just read it from there. There's a dude named Eritos who's killed by Dionysus. He hits him with his pine cone cane. Uh, Hecate, she burns this guy Cletos to death. Hephaestus burns this other guy, Mimas, to death. Um, Athena kills um, this dude. Uh, well, she kills two. First, she kills Pallas. And that's the big part I took from my book. I'm like, oh, Pallas. Wait, tell me more about Pallas. Pallas, because that tied in with the whole, that's part of the whole thing with the Aegis, right? She kills Pallas, who seems to be a goat-like giant, pulls off his skin. And in this version, that's where she gets the Aegis from. Doesn't work out with some of the other versions, so I kind of combined that into there's multiple steps. The first version of the of the Aegis, this is her cape that she uses as her defense, comes from uh, Almathea, the goat that suckled uh, baby Zeus. He gives that to Athena after he, after he accidentally leads, uh, he does something that leads to accidentally to the death of her friend Pallas. Then she meets a giant named Pallas who's weirdly goat-like already. That name has severe connotations for her. She meets him in the field of battle and just pulls his skin off. And that's, okay, that's the big part I use in my book. You can read it in Athena. Then, after she's armored in this thing she gets from Pallas, which, by the way, then, remember Megan's drawing where Perseus gives the head of Medusa to Athena? Yeah, she then takes the head of Medusa and adds that to that. The Aegeus was made in steps. This is one of the steps. So she's wearing uh, Pallas' skin. She kills another guy named, um, I think it's Enceladus? Wait, I have the note. I should read this. Yes, Enceladus. In fact, she kills him... You know, she's already pulled off one Gigante's son. She picks up Sicily, the entire island of Sicily, and throws it on him. And, according to Apollodorus, that's why Mount Etna on Sicily has the smoke coming out. But again, we know that doesn't quite work because that's the reason why, supposedly, I mean, Typhon is the reason that Etna smokes. So there's a whole bunch of things. You can see how I chose other stories over this one. It just contradicts too much stuff. Uh, Poseidon kills Polybotus. Uh, he throws another island at him, Nisiros. Uh, Hermes kills this guy, Hippolytus. Uh, Artemis kills this guy, Aegean. Uh, the Fates get into it. They kill two guys. Um, it's just this crazy story. But here's my biggest problem with this. Not only the fact that this makes it seem like the gods, the all-powerful Olympian gods, can't kill these gigantes, but Heracles can? Which is like, all right, I have a problem with that. Also, I mean, there's several stories in there that kind of contradict other stories I want to tell. Antaeus, Ant I mean, Antaeus, that's a cool story. Um, the whole idea of Etna smoking because of uh, Athena throwing on top of a gigante, but I wanted to save that for Typhon. My biggest problem is the inclusion of Heracles because this is a crazy battle. We're talking entire islands are being ripped from the surface of the earth and thrown. And this happens in the time of Heracles and Dionysus? Both of these gods are... And this is during... This isn't even, like, later. This isn't, like, ascendant, some sort of, like, Olympian version of Heracles that we never really hear about, but we think is maybe there. This is specifically, he is immortal. So it's during his mortal lifespan on the planet Earth. 
which we know is maybe only one or two generations tops before the Trojan War. This is well in the age of human civilization. There are literally people at the time of the Trojan War who knew Heracles. They were alive while gods were ripping up entire islands and throwing them at giant monsters. I know this is, this is the nature of myth. The stories are often contradictory. They don't need to make a lot of sense. But with Olympians, I really wanted to establish a timeline that made sense. And it just didn't make sense for a conflagration, a battle of this scale that literally transformed the surface of the earth to happen in the time of Heracles and Dionysus. Like that's just, that would be the biggest story ever. It would be so crazy that it would overwhelm all the other myths because nobody ever talked about it. They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you killed the Minotaur? Who cares? That guy picked up an island and threw it. So, Apollodorus, thank you for chronicling one of the most complete versions of, that exists of the Gigantomachy. But for various reasons, I just couldn't use much of yours. But thank you for the palace. That was a big bit. And also, I'm just going to say here, the coolest part the coolest part of the Gigantomachy is not mentioned anywhere in Apollodorus' version. That we find in Ovid. So it's, if you look at the image I used to promote today's talk, it's a picture of the Gigantes ripping up mountains and stacking them one atop each other so it's as tall as Mount Olympus. And this is something that we learned in Metamorphosis. O Ovid talks about this. So here is a Greek myth that in the earliest Greek myths, we don't hear really anything about it. There's no mention of the Gigantomachy in Hesiod. There's maybe references in Homer, but it's debatable. And it's not until later that you start seeing people talking about it. And the most iconic image from it, of them tearing up mountains so they can attack Mount Olympus, that doesn't occur until like the Roman era. But that's just too good. So that's what Ovid is the one who talks about this. He even names the mountains. It's like Mount Peleus and Mount Alta. Like all these mountains, it puts them one atop each other. And in his version, it's something that happened a long time ago. There's no Heracles because I think he had the same problem I did. He's like, that's not long enough ago. They're ripping up mountains. And I can see where those mountains go now. They're not near each other. And in his version, Zeus and the other gods, they meet the – and it's short. So I had to fill in a lot of details. They meet these Gigantes, and Zeus is throwing his lightning bolts and shatters their mountains, and they fall to the ground. And he talks about how you could find the bodies of the Gigantes everywhere, which is also kind of super cool, because one of the things they think about the Gigantes, these giants, these giants, I'm trying so hard not to use that word, but there's just no way around it. It's become the word to mean really big things in our language. Like, there's a scene in my book, Athena, where you see the fates. They're telling the story from a graveyard of the giants, and there's like kind of these big bones around them. They think that it might have been the ancient Greeks like finding the bones of like dinosaurs and stuff and being like, well, what the heck is this? Must have been a gigante. And I kind of really think that idea is cool. And the gigantes, to be sure, they are associated with places. Like there's different locations. I mentioned that they come from the land of Pelene, but that was kind of open ending where that is. It's a semi-mythical land, right? And they talk about there's different places where people locate those and those places coincide in a lot of instances with either places where fossils have been found of dinosaurs or other giant extinct fauna or volcanoes. And there certainly is a volcanic connection there. Like we, like the idea that when Athena throws um, Sicily, the entire island of Sicily at, uh, what's his face? Um, is it Porphyron? No. And Salidas, um, that Mount Etna is smoking from it. There seems to be this connection between them. And the fact that they rip up mountains. What is a volcano except for a mountain tearing itself up, right? It's, I don't know. It's just some cool stuff. So that's my sources for this. And it just, it stands to reason when you read this. Like, this is a later attempt. I mean, it's not, stand, this isn't even like me hype you know, making a hypothesis here. It's explicitly stated in some of these later writers who hadn't yet conflated this thing completely with the Titanomachy. This was a later attempt engineered by Mother Earth to overthrow the Olympians because she was angry. And in Ovid, he even mentions like that he, she, like she, so we learned in Hesiod, they were born when blood spilled on her. So they weren't planned children of her. But Ovid mentions that Mother Earth herself gives them this power. And there's these, 
uh, attempts. Like, like it's just another thing where Mother Earth mad at the Olympian rule, which I'm always so fascinated by the idea that Mother Earth is trying to overthrow the gods. Like, it's gods against the planet we're on. That's super cool. So um, there's some other... I'm going to call them honorary gigantes. And depending on the source, sometimes they're included in this. Sometimes they're just called gigantes, but they have uh, a separate role in here. Um, most this you've, I already mentioned one of them kind of there's Ephialtes who the Ephialtes I mentioned is the dude that Apollo shoots in one eye and Heracles shoots in the other, but the Eloidae we've, we've talked about them. Otis and Ephialtes, they're brothers the twin sons of Poseidon who grow exponentially bigger each year and keep attacking Mount Olympus. Is it the same Ephialtes? Maybe. Different people telling stories about it, so it goes in a very different direction. And sometimes, I think Ovid actually kind of hints that they are part of the Gigantomachy, because there's another story of Otis and Ephialtes. I never really got into one of these books. It's kind of a fun one, too. That, and I kind of set it up to happen in Olympians, but I never got a chance to follow through on it. In Athena, there is the bit when the gods are attacking. I mean, when the, when the gigantes are attacking and you see Ares alone in the field and he's like feeling cranky and salty that Athena is giving him orders. He's like, kill them. What does he think she is? What does he think I'm doing? He's cutting things, things up to left and right. And he turns around. Suddenly he's in a shadow and looming above him is the enormous figure of Pallas, the palace that Athena ends up skinning to make the Aegis. And Pallas just with a club, smacks Ares, and he just flies off the battlefield over a mountain. Now, originally, in a later book, I was going to have a scene where he lands and he's kind of dazed, because even though he's immortal, that still hurts. And before he can recover, two gigantes who are part of this battle scoop him up and stick him upside down in this bronze urn. And that's Otis and Ephialtes. And it's this really kind of fun little story where they stick him upside down, they seal him in, they're like, hey, hey, hey. And he doesn't have any sort of, like, uh, traction. He can't, he's in a position where he can't break loose. Now, he could have changed shape probably, but he's there. He's not the smartest. So he's trapped. And he's trapped like that for, like, 15 months. And kind of an Olympus, nobody really cares because, like, Ares is unpleasant. And finally, like, the only one who really cares is Aphrodite, and she finally convinces Hermes to, like, go, like, can you go, like, find him? And Hermes finds him, and he's like, oh, man, he's been stuck upside down this whole time. There really ended up not, it was going to be an Ares, but it took us away from the action. It really made Ares look bad, and Ares looked bad already enough in that book. And, like, it just wasn't, it didn't have room for it, so I never got to put it in. But that was, so Otis and Ephialtes, I that was why they're not in the final battle, because they go run off with Ares stuck. But they do come back later, and they mount the multiple attacks at Mount Olympus. Also, charged up by Mother Earth in that. There's um, Antinous, who are, or Antias, I keep saying Antinous. Antias, who is the gigante that Heracles crushes over his head. That's, he's not part of that, but he's definitely considered a gigante. And then there's Pallas himself, who in Athena, my book Athena, I made Pallas the leader. That's really kind of... I just did that because it had to be the climactic battle. I really can't find much source material saying Pallas is the leader. Pallas is kind of just mentioned as being the god that she kills, and I mean the gigante that Athena kills and skins. But um, I also like the fact that like Pallas shared the name with her childhood best friend who she accidentally murdered, and that there was this, this repetition in Athena's life of the name Pallas, and all these different, and it connects with these stages of the ages. So I kind of knitted stuff together, wove my own tapestry, if you will, of my version of the Gigantomachy. Um, one last little detail that I'm going to throw in here, because like I said, Guys, this is a scattershot one. There's a lot of little weird details and stuff. I kind of knitted this together from a lot of different sources. The coolest account I've ever found of a gigante comes not from a myth. It comes from an actual history. So there was a Roman historiographer, historiographer, historian, let's just say historian. Why am I making up words? Uh, named Cassius Dio. And he wrote a book called Roman History. Just right. He wrote a book called Roman History. And in Roman History, written by Cassius Dio, he accounts, he writes his account of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius was the eruption in 79 AD that killed, well, that's an understatement, destroyed Pompeii and Herculaneum and buried both those cities beneath ash and lava. And according to Cassius Dio, 
in the days, so remember, there's this idea prevalent among the Greeks and by extension, the Romans, that uh, the, a lot of these gigantes had been buried beneath volcanic regions, that when the gods defeated them, they just threw islands and stuff on them, right? Uh, or mountains or whatever. They buried them underground and that was volcanic regions. So there was apparently some evidence leading up to the eruption of Vesuvius that that volcano was active again. According to Cassius Dio, people started seeing giants. Like, he describes as being human in form, but far bigger than any human could ever be. And they see it on the mountain. They see like, these figures kind of, they're like, oh, that's weird, right? And then during the actual eruption itself, and the mountain actually erupts, Cassius Dio writes that people saw like these smoky, like enormous figures in the flames. And he calls them straight up. They're the Gigantes. They were released. And that's why Vesuvius exploded. I mean, pretty cool. The whole thing is pretty neat, I think. Um, he wasn't there. I don't know who he spoke to that could have been there to see this because, you know, there was pretty, uh, pretty high mortality rate of people in Vesuvius. But it's pretty neat that he's claiming that there were actually these visions of like these giant smoke enshrouded flaming monsters that were erupting from the ground. And that's, I mean, I don't know pretty neat. So that's pretty much what I have to say about Gigantes. Um, like all over the place, but so are these myths. There just isn't, oh, I did want to talk about how an art. So this is tying back into my own personal experience, right? I knew about the Gigantomachy. I never really had it placed as being this major moment in the reign of the, of the Olympians. And it's not until I was living in Rome and traveling around and seeing so many temples had the Gigantomachy as a sign. Like, there would be, they would have the friezes on the side, like, of, like the pediments of the temples. And there would be so many depictions of the gods finding the Gigantes. And then you would even see, like, some cool art, like, especially, actually, this is a little bit later in the Renaissance period, showing them, because they were pulling a lot on Ovid, showing the Gigantes stacking up the mountains to be as tall as Mount Olympus becomes very popular, too. And this stuff filled my mind with such cool ideas. Because the Titanomachy, the clash against the Titans is super cool, let's be honest. You know, Zeus and Hera and everybody fighting against the, uh, the Titans. But the problem is, you only get in those first six. You don't get in, like, the later generation Olympians. This is like a story, it's like revisiting, like, that greatest hits, the Titanomachy. But now you get in all the gods. And also, there's not just, like... 12 of them you're fighting against you're fighting against i mean some versions there's a hundred gigantes or maybe more like they're not all named but there is surprisingly long list of the characters were named and it's just like this crazy battle so it became a really fun thing to draw and hence you've seen it revisited in many of my books you see it briefly in hera you see it a little bit more lengthily in athena i'm sure it makes a few other appearances right off the t i can't think of them off the top of my head um and so, yeah, so I figure that's enough talking about this, and now I'm going to take your questions. I see the first question. Pallas, is he part, this is from Megan, hi Megan. Pallas, is he part of the Gigantes, or is he a different race from it? Uh, the same race of Gigantes. So that's actually a good question, because there seems to be some confusion. Um, he is mentioned specifically as a Gigante in the Apollodorus account. Hesiod mentions a palace, maybe it's not the same palace, as actually being a titan, a second generation titan. He is actually a brother to Persis, the destroyer, and Astraeus, the starry one. He's probably not, a not the same guy because titans are immortal, they couldn't pull their skin off, whereas gigantes don't seem to be mortal because they all get killed. Um, but my depiction of him... I kind of used that as an excuse to draw him my palace because he is often conflated with the other palace. I drew him as big as a titan. He seems to be of a more superior quality. Also, he has the goat-like elements, which that also pops up in other accounts. Like, palace is definitely because they made the Aegea, the Aegis from, which means literally goat skin. For sources where they use palace as the thing who had been skinned, he had to have goat-like features. So... I think personally he is the same race as the other Gigantes. It's just that he's uh, 
yeah, maybe he's like a little bit of a mutant. Maybe he got a little bit more supercharged from Mother Earth. Maybe there's just a certain amount of genetic – well, they're not genetic. A certain amount of variety in the way they appear, and he just happens to be a little bit more goat-like. Mentioning the idea of races, I should have mentioned this actually. Um, in um, Ovid's version of this, when the Gigantes are defeated – and they're all smashed down to the earth by Zeus and the gods, and their graves fill the earth. Um, Mother Earth still isn't done with them. They're killed. And they describe, Ab describes the field of gore. Like, it's just like the earth, again, another reason this, there's no way this happened in recent time. There's just like a field of like smushed giants, right? Their bodies are everywhere. And from that field of gore, Mother Earth creates a new race of humans. And they're not named. We don't know what they are. Like, I don't know if Ovid was thinking of a specific group of people. They're like, oh, those guys come from gigantic guts. But they were raised, like, in imitation again, who were already raised. The, tit- the Titans, you could already argue that the Gigantes were raised in imitation of the Titans. A race of man were raised in imitation of the Gigantes. And Ovid says, and they hated the gods. And they had the, like, kind of attitude and maybe even the memories of the Gigantes. So that's kind of cool, too. Um, would <laughs> – yeah, he asks, would Poseidon eat fish raw or cooked? Would Poseidon eat fish, period? I don't know. I mean, here's the thing. The gods, of course, mostly eat nectar and ambrosia, right? That's what we have in the accounts. And there do seem to be instances where, at least to be polite, they will partake of other food. First thing that pops to mind for me is, unfortunately, the Feast of Tantalus, where he serves his own son Pelops as dinner. And the gods are like, this is, they immediately see, like, this is people, don't eat people. But except for Demeter, who's, like, totally bumming out because that's during the abduction of Persephone, so she eats a little piece. Ew. Um, so... I don't know. Would he? Would he? Did, I don't. I feel like he. Huh. Okay. I feel like they're really, unless he was trying to appease somebody else or to be diplomatic, I feel like Poseidon wouldn't eat fish. And then that makes me just think of his general nature that Poseidon's not really somebody who's likely to appease somebody or to be kind or to like care about politics. He's kind of Poseidon. He's like, I do what I want. I don't think he's going to eat fish. Maybe if he's at a banquet. Okay, I don't know that the ancient Greeks ate raw fish, but maybe there was a banquet where he's playing nice and he's playing with the other Olympians. Maybe fish was served. He probably ate cooked fish, like took a bite or two and was like, thanks. You know, I don't know. It's an interesting question though. Uh, Big chance Ares is immortal because he could be dead so badly. Uh, I'm not sure what that means exactly. Uh, I think it's very lucky that Ares is immortal because he was stuck upside down for 15 months in a... uh, uh, you know, an urn. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of instances where Ares would have been killed if he was not, if he was able to be killed, certainly. Um, funny, not, oh, this is from Anika. Funny side note about Gigantes in modern day Greece. Oh, I do this too. It's a yummy Greek dish slash meal made of giant beans, lima beans, butter beans, etc. Yeah, I know that because actually when I was in Greece, I had some because I got excited. I'm like, oh, God, it's Gigantes. What is it? It's like beans. It's like, oh, weird. Um, yeah. So that's – you say that to a Greek person, and Anika is Greek. Uh, they don't think of giant weird monkey people. They don't think of giant serpent people. They probably don't think of soldiers that just look kind of generic. They think of giant beans. But <laughs> see what else we have here. Um, oh, not a lot of question today. So does Dionysus play musical instruments? Hmm. I can't think of any myths where he does. That's interesting. I feel it. Okay, so Dionysus um, is always at the center of a party, right? He literally travels with his own party. He has a retinue of different satyrs and nymphs and bacchanades and whomever has joined him. And I think he brings like his own bands with them that way. I, I, man, I'm going to say something that's maybe a little unkind to, to, uh, uh, to Dionysus. I don't think he would uh, have the patience to take the time to like kind of master a, a musical instrument. I think he's just – he's – the whole thing about him, you know how they, like, it's been very – it's very common in modern thought to place him in juxtaposition to, uh, to Apollo where Apollo represents order and Dionysus represents chaos. And that doesn't match up 100% of the ancient Greek depiction, except for in some ways he he's definitely an agent of chaos. And I feel like 
music wise he doesn't have that temperament to master a weapon he might do like uh you know weird music that kind of like atonal sort of jazz stuff where he just picks up a drum and just bangs it randomly or something but i don't i don't think i I can't think of any instance where he plays an instrument and i just don't think that he would want to like except for like you know satyrs playing in pan pipes i think he'd be the sort of guy who'd like really enjoy like birds singing but i don't think he'd be the sort of guy to make music himself um, let's see what else we got here. Does Orpheus go on the Argo before or after Eurydice died? Uh, I, that's a great question. Cause it's one of those things you're like, you have to work that in. Like, how does that work? I'm going to have to say it's before. Cause after Eurydice dies, by all accounts, he is kind of a shell of himself. That being said, there is, I do remember, um, one of the sons of, uh, Boreas, Calais, is in some later traditions. So Orpheus, after he's with Eurydice, he's famously like, I never want to be with a woman again. But there is an account where he and Calais are a couple. I think it's Calais, it, it's the one. And so maybe he knew him before and like he kept in touch with them. Maybe Calais looked in on his old buddy and like some sparks flew or something. I don't know. Or perhaps maybe in an attempt to forget briefly, maybe maybe it wasn't an attempt to forget. Maybe the dude was straight up just like, I don't care anymore. I'm going to go on this crazy quest to the ends of the earth because who cares what happens to me? Maybe he joins up with the Argo and he just goes. And like, you know, it's like, good, we're going to the underworld. Yeah, great. I've been there before. Who cares? Nihilism. And, you know, so he goes through all this, this trouble. I don't know. I, okay, I picture in my personal belief, I like the idea he went on before. He marries Eurydice. It ends poorly. His old buddy looks in on him. They have maybe a little bit brief relationship. It's not enough to make Orpheus a happy guy. And then eventually Orpheus gets teared apart by the followers of Dionysus. Uh, actually, there's some proof right there that maybe Dionysus doesn't play instruments because uh, it kind of ends badly for Orpheus there, doesn't it? Um, let's see what else we got here. Heracles looks like Zeus. He does. I drew that very much on purpose. There's even a line um, I have in my book, Hera, where Heracles, I drew, like, so Zeus is kind of like a lot more divine looking. He's a lot more perfect than Heracles. Heracles, especially the way I drew him, he eventually shows, we see him age throughout the course of that story. He bears the scars of his battles, literally. And like he loses his hair and he gets kind of grizzled and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, that would never happen to Zeus. But there, when we see Heracles the first time, when he's at that crossroads and he makes the choice to be a god who works, you know, he, well, a, he, a demigod who works for it, basically. He doesn't take the life of leisure. He decides to take the life of, of toil. Um, I drew him there to look very much like his dad. And there's even a line in the text where it mentions, like, he, maybe of all of his children, is the most like his father. And maybe that's why Hera detested him so. Does Hera love Zeus? Wow. That's uh that's a tricky one. Um she's got to, right? Like on some level, I I when I wrote these books, I kind of went out of my way to show that they have a good connection at first, and it it definitely gets more polluted as it goes, but it is an interesting question like is it basically like cuz she is the goddess of marriage, she can't she she's literally I mean, she's the goddess of other things too, but one of her main functions is the goddess of marriage, and it would kind of undermine her entire like state if she were to be divorced. And we know divorce exists back then. It's an interesting question. It's definitely where I feel like there's got to be at least a spark of something, right? Um, maybe you know they say the line between love and hate is very thin. Maybe she kind of exists in that line and vacillates back and forth, like. I, I, I think, honestly, they probably have a really strong physical connection and they come together over that periodically. But then he goes off and he's creeping. And she's like, oh. And then maybe that's how that whole idea with Argus Panoptes fits in there. Uh, ooh, Lien 1999, or Jen 1999 writes, Have you ever heard of the Stephen Sondheim musical, The Frogs? In this story, Dionysus goes to the underworld to fetch a playwright. On the way, he meets Hercules, who gives him advice dressed big. Okay, I didn't know Stephen Sondheim did this. I know the original Frogs, which is very much the same story. It's an actual ancient uh, Greek comedy. God, is it by Euripides? It's literally, I actually... It may or may not be in Dionysus because I have a joke to it. But yeah, it's – it's Dionysus goes down to the underworld 
and it was written for like some big drama competition in ancient Greece. And he actually wants to fetch a certain playwright. I think the playwright he's fetching is Euripides. I want to say maybe it's Aeschylus wrote this. Gosh, I didn't know Sondheim did like a modern musical version of this, a modern major general. I'm going to have to look that up because I want to hear that. But yeah, it's this old, and it's kind of weird. And there's actually a scene in there that I really love, and it's a scene that is not going to fit into Dionysus, but I'll probably make a comic of it, where, I, okay, I don't know if this is Sondheim or the original. Maybe it's in both. It's definitely in the original, where uh, Dionysus, who you'll notice I always depict him wearing like a leopard skin pelt, He's kind of doing that to kind of like, there's a scene where he and uh, Heracles are talking. And this is before Heracles has ascended to Olympus and before he's ascended to Olympus. They're both mortal at this point. And Heracles has the Nemean lion skin. And he's kind of like, check it out. I got like a big cat skin too. And Heracles is basically like, yeah, mine's like this like invulnerable monster. Yours is what? He's like, it's a leopard. <laughs> it's just this funny little bit. It's kind of to show like, it's, it's a weird take. It's, it's definitely a comedy. But, like, Dionysus comes off – he's definitely, like, he's trying to compare himself to Heracles. And, like, Dionysus is probably more powerful than Heracles, but not certainly not in the physical way. And it's this really funny little thing. I did not know that Sondheim did that, though. That's great piece of advice, Jen. I'm going to look that up. Um, oh, apparently I'm the only person who didn't know this because other people – does a gigante eat an elephant? <laughs> uh, I figure, yes, it has to have certainly happened at some point. Um, yeah, he asked, does Dionysus look like Zeus? Shallower chin, though. I tried to make Dionysus look the least like Zeus of his kids in many aspects, because even though, ironically, Heracles is also a demigod, uh, I was trying to play up the fact that Dionysus has a mortal parent. And for me, it's a very fascinating thing about Dionysus, because... Um, he's the only Olympian, the only full-fledged, fully regarded Olympian who is that way, you know, depending on how you view Heracles who dies and maybe half of him goes to Olympus, but we never really hear anything about him up there. So yeah, I, I gave him, he's, he's of a narrower build. He's a little bit more human looking. If you look carefully, sometimes he's the only Olympian with it. He even has one or two chest hairs because like he actually has human blood in him. The other gods take on a human form in imitation of humans, but he actually Dionysus has a real human form. He could change shape, certainly, but like he's the only one who I think is really like a person. Uh, did Hephaestus? Oh, we're getting into some deep stuff here. Ever really love Aphrodite? Hmm. Aristophanes. That's who wrote it. Thank you. That's who wrote Frogs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pan Panthelestic poet. Thank you. That was driving me nuts. Um, does he, he, hmm hmm. Okay, there's different types of love, and there's different ways people can love. And I feel like, regarding Aphrodite, because she is the goddess of love, to literally know her is to love her. So I feel like everyone around her loves Aphrodite in some way. Except for maybe the goddesses that, you know, the maiden goddesses, the ones that she specifically can't touch. Like, not, like, physically, but, like, she, her power just doesn't affect them. They've shut off a whole portion of their being. Um, so I do feel Hephaestus truly loved her, in a way. There's all different ways. And I'm not saying that as a quantifier, like, he didn't really love her. I think he really did love her. But um, just his way of relating to the world was not, it wasn't big enough for the love that she needs. She needs all the love there is. And he was really good at being very uh, demonstrative by giving gifts and stuff for her. But he just didn't have the sort of – ironic because he is a god of fire. He didn't have the sort of spark that really needed to make that relationship gel. And it's, it seems like the person that she found it with the most completely was Ares, the bloodthirsty god of war. So I'll take that as you will. We're just about time here. Um, let's see. Uh, do we have any more questions here? Oh, a few people have told me about Aristophanes. In Sondheim's version, Dionysus goes to get George Bernard Shaw, but ends up bringing back Shakespeare. All right, I've got to go listen to this. Like, I'm literally going to do it when I go working. Uh, and then Dionysus looks more human. Dino, da, 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 da. Okay, I think it's just, um, just some comments here. So I'm actually just going to uh, sign off now. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all of you who came with Aristophanes. Um, and uh, yeah, this has been Geek Speaks Greek. If you have any pictures that you want to send me or any comments or write more about stuff, things like Aristophanes, 
Email me at georgeoconnorbooks at gmail.com. And I'll see you all Friday when the topic will be – I'm not sure yet. We'll figure that out then. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye.